science fiction ha used to carry some kind of almost negative social stigma. That is to say, it just wasn't on par with uh, other types of maybe art or 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 a popular culture. And and this is this is a very interesting aspect of media history in that there used to be a much more divided caste system, right? And kind of think about class uh, hierarchies. And um, science fiction was 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 low brow initially, um, and perhaps it's because it's a little bit of a late bloomer compared to other storytelling genres. Maybe the um, for for U.S. audiences or readers or what have you, something like the American Western kind of forged itself in the 20th century and was was kind of a dominant genre by the mid-century. And um, other, you know, the, the comedy, the silent comedy um, uh, to, into the talkies, right? And, thus, and then eventually the romantic comedies and the, and the other types of outbreaking entertainments. These had more mainstream popularity. Uh, and, and so they, if something didn't represent a mass uh, consumable idea or object, it it ran a risk of being alienated. And so science fiction uh, has some roots in horror, and I think this is teased a little bit in our initial reading, um, but in science fiction, um, we can look at the birth of it along the lines of when what Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is written. And so, interestingly enough, an origin of science fiction is, is very much tethered to this idea of horror at the same time. And so sometimes we do still see this kind of synthesis between horror and science fiction occasionally in interesting ways. And, uh, and this, isn't, this isn't a horror genre focused class, but that DNA exists, right? And we may even see sort of kernels of it as we're looking at, at this subgenre of science fiction. Of course, coming up in the age of, let's say, comics. Comics were uh, previously sort of viewed as children's fare, right? Disposable throwaway materials. And um, for that reason, it was looked at as lower than culture. And science fiction was, 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 often, was popularized in, in comics form, and it was, it was kind of um, developed in certain ways. They had magazines where you might find short stories of, of horror or sci-fi. Um, and so that's where it kind of, it, it found its footing in, in the pulps, as they say, in pulpy, pulp fiction style, cheap, disposable narratives. Um, but uh, over time, you, you definitely had the, the intellectual community investing in science fiction for every, everyone from uh, Jules Verne to Aldous Huxley, um, um, a lot of these, these novelists. And so with that, you see a lot of maybe Victorian principles um, a lot of those British sensibilities kind of cultivating this sort of thinking, thinking persons, you know, formerly thinking man, science fiction. And, and that, that aspect is kind of borrowed and brought into Star Trek. Um, and so science fiction has a lot of uh, ways in which it stretches out. And that, that speaks to the dexterity of genres in general. If you have uh, taken a gander at I'm gonna grab our, our key readings here. I whizzed through this. I'm so excited because this is such a, a relatively quick read. Uh, our primary book, uh, in, uh, Science Fiction Film, a critical introduction. Um, and that the, the opening chapters there really lay out that sort of history of, of not only of how this genre emerges and becomes popularized. And I think that's, that's really important for us and something we can kind of talk about and take away as we go. So that said, let's fast forward. We don't want to get lost in the details, um, but what we do want to appreciate is at a certain point in time um, uh, in, in a genre's life cycle, it starts to innovate. And, and almost you can think about like cells that duplicate. Genres go through these cycles, and sometimes the more popularized they become, they have these, these unique sub-genres that emerge, and they can become so strong in their own right, they become their own genres. When I say something like the rom-com, the romantic comedy, well, that's its own thing now, but it, it, it evolved from something else. And so entertainments do this. And, uh, and so, you know, this is, this is how we have 
super superhero stories, right? If we think about something that's immensely popular in culture right now, it's evolved from, from previous versions and we can kind of recognize it in different ways, different strands, right? Uh, people will say, well, there's a tone to Marvel stories that is different from the tone of DC stories and the, the sort of the heroes act different. They kind of abide by different codes. And that's sort of an evolutionary track of understanding genre uh, and its dexterity. Um, so by the, we're, we're not going to necessarily put an, an initial starting point on Future Shock um, because in fact one of the earliest films, uh, Fritz Lang's Metropolis, is, is a phenomenal example of Future Shock cinema. And uh, in the film Metropolis we have this sort of German expressionistic silent feature that's about a kind of utopian society of the future that may actually be a dystopic society, right? A dystopian uh, society. And, um, and, and it, it's, it, it even embraces a, a kind of artificial intelligence character, right? That's kind of captured in, in feminine form. And I mean, it's doing bold, uh, even risque at times, things with silent uh, uh, cinema, right? All the way, black and white foreign film um, and but these ideas you can't you can't uh, let go of them right they have an ability to kind of grab on latch on and, and haunt the viewer and so we can see Metropolis a film like that where it's long it's it, it may not it, does, it may not work well in this setting but as a kind of birthing station in the film medium and that's that's a medium a mass medium uh, of communication that we're going to emphasize in this course, we have um, this emergence of uh, this idea coincides with the book uh, by the same name. All right, so um, it, in a time period, roughly, you know, it's being researched and written and processed probably in the, in the 1960s, but then hitting right at the start of the 70s. Alvin Toffler has the uh, book Future Shock. Uh, for which this term sort of gets woven into the, the popular imagination. And, and this is where we see maybe evolutionary steps in science fiction that, that follow a distinct kind of pattern. And it's interpretive, right? This is somewhat subjective, but I think there's, I think there's a, a through line that we'll be able to identify over time. Um, and so we're sort of reading readings and watching these features um, collectively, thinking about and processing this idea, well, what is Future Shock 1? And then two, how does it manifest in different ways? And then three, what do these, what do these future visions say about today? And how are they communicating tensions, anxieties, inequalities that we face in the here and now, but they purport them in a kind of present future, a distant type of worldview. And so I think that's where you can really connect with the, with the film, with the text, with the work, is being able to isolate these themes and, and kind of process how Gomez is, 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 is uh, prophesying in a way, right? It, it is kind of visualizing uh, our, our anxieties, our fears, tensions with, with certain aspects of culture, with technology, maybe with economy. And, and so each, each film we look at every week in here, we're gonna carve out a different path. There's five strands, and of course I sent out the videos. I wanted to be able to just jump right in and cut all the fat of the syllabus reading and that sort of thing in week one. I just want, to, I just want us to go in a future shot kind of way. Just go for it, jump in. And so uh, we, we, want, we want to do a deep dive, and, and, we, and we will, um, but we're, we're laying out some core themes. So uh, hopefully you've checked out those videos. I kind of went with a direction where I want to create a video syllabus. And so the videos I've been posting on the news feed are segments. Each segment talks about a different avenue of the course, and I want to kind of bury us in, in time going over that. We have these three main books. Um, science fiction film critical introduction, film genre from Rick Altman, and keywords and media studies from uh, Laurie Willett and Jonathan Gray. And I wanted to uh, just emphasize again, this is kind of our primary one. We're going to get the most out of this science fiction one. 
Um, and so it's giving us a rich media history. It's creating context for us. It's telling us about what other people have written about or said or, or scholars. It's connecting movies for us. So it's setting a good example there. This one is kind of like you think about like a theory book. It's, it's teaching us about genre. And I think, I think what's so valuable about that book, uh, film genre from Rick Altman is, um, is it's doing all this business. It's not just talking about, oh, okay, film genres, and here's some different, in this chapter we're talking about this genre, and this chapter we're talking about that. It's doing more than that. Uh, it has specific areas. It's talking about how it's a, it's a practice, it's a process, how it, how it crosses over into advertising, how it crosses over into marketing strategies. So it's not just about creative storytelling. It's about how we create consumer culture. It's about how, how not just Hollywood, but how the entertainment industry is, is this institution that's an economic powerhouse. It sort of helps us start to comprehend how in the world uh, a, a vast majority of wealth and power are built around uh, arguably six or seven media corporations, right? When you think about the kind of the reach and the access that they have, and, and so we can link that back in genre theory can help us achieve that. And then this keywords in media studies is just a fun experiment. Um, we're in a communication discipline, but our discipline embraces a lot of interdisciplinary qualities, uh, including cultural studies, including uh, film, you know, film studies. Uh, we, we journey into television studies occasionally. And, um, uh, and, and it's all built around this idea that, that there are these shared language sets. And so this is a juicy, book it's very reader really friendly these entries are super duper short in keywords and each it's, it's kind of like encyclopedic information but written in a way that's teaching us about the discourse language that's used to talk about these texts and then ultimately i've been kind of pumping and, and priming us to to really consider investing in something like a like a film journal um i'll tell you the kernels the birth the, uh, the birth of these ideas for this course they came in my old film journal I used when I taught a semester-long film course. We didn't even cover science fiction in that class, and uh, and so I you know I still I was but what I was also starting to do is jot down ideas like what's the evolution of this course like where does it go from here, and and the back of this book there was a lot of ideas and I feel like uh, among the strongest ideas uh, was. Um, uh, was this course idea, was this future shock emphasis. And when we entered a, a remote situation in 2020, early 2020, and we suddenly found ourselves at the precipice of this pandemic event in human history, uh, everything was just clicking into place right at the time when it, the theme needed to be due to the registrar's office. And we realized like now's the time, like let's strike while it's hot. This is so pertinent. This type of theme, this type of genre generic theme, is it should resonate with this. And, and if it doesn't, if it doesn't sort of like whether it resonates in a positive way or resonates in a negative way, that it's it is 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 really we're ambivalent to that. Because what we're trying to do is to sort of see how uh, cinema is this language set that's that's expressing ideas. And has a has a potential to comment on things and make us uh, you know feel uh, if not if not kind of recognize these in other ways. And so I have have my nice sci-fi green journal. I'm excited about. I've been taking some sci-fi future shot type notes in it, getting ready for this class, and I'll, I'll be taking more as well. It's my process, uh, but we're encouraging it. And then of course we. Outside of this, we want to hear your thoughts, but we want to give you the space to process on your own and kind of just think about it. And so that's why we added that. We want to give you just a, a space, your own private kind of, but I mean like relatively private, but like timeline private, production private, uh, space to, to, to vlog, to like create a little bit of a video journal that you can post in our, in our closed new uh, uh, discussion feeds online. We want, just want to hear your thoughts, whether it's on the readings or the films or whatever, and everyone's not always that, you know, interested in immediately unpacking something or opening up. And we want to respect that space, but give you a, a platform to just be able to, what's on your mind, right? How do you feel about that? I mean, yeah, if you didn't like take take it, you know, why? Take, you know, pull it apart. If you if you loved it, figure out what was it about it that, that struck a chord. And so that's that's a little bit of our materials for the course in a nutshell. Uh, next, um, Future Shock weekly themes. So we're going to have weekly themes 
And again, I preview those in one of our videos, the video of syllabus. But here are some themes to look out for this week. Week one themes, all right? So we're, here's some, some potential ideas that are gonna pop up. First one, eco disaster, all right? I would identify that one type of future shock film is going to have an emphasis on eco disaster, right? It's, it's the kind of movie that's, that's predicting a, a negative outcome in, in a society and it's linked to ecological uh, unraveling, right? And so we're, we're gonna buy into this idea. We're gonna, we're gonna get a taste of it. That doesn't always look like the same thing. Just like we said, like the day after tomorrow, it's about the ice caps uh, melting or whatever and, and the whole world's a, a frozen wasteland, right? And we're, we're gonna kind of see variations in this formula from time to time. Premature arrival of the future. So in Toffler's Future Shock, um, he's talking about essentially this type of, this type of mindset deals, often deals with our humanity's struggle with, in, with the increased pace of life and the kinds of, of technological onsets that, that, you know, create uh, maybe like instability, right? That, that can kind of become maddening in effect. And, and so this idea of uh, a premature arrival of the future, that is to say a breakthrough happens and suddenly life is dramatically different. The internet, you know, changes everything. A pandemic changes everything. Uh, maybe what, social media. It changes everything. All of a sudden we're more vocal than we were, but we're not saying the same things we would have said before, but we're reading other people's thoughts. And we, there used to be a, a saying like, think before you speak, right? And now it's just like, just post, just hit it, right? You just go to town and what are the consequences? I don't know, except when we start to see those consequences, right? Think about all these viral videos going around now. And people are, they're, they'll react with their, with their finger mouths, but now they're reacting in other ways too. And that's not everyone. We know this, that's outliers, but social change, right, is afoot. And so this premature arrival of the future creates tension, it creates anxiety. And so one of, according to Toffler's theorization, and it's just a theorization, all right? It's not about if we don't subscribe to these ideas, it doesn't automatically mean, okay, I get, I get to check out, of course, like free pass or, or I reject the premise in week one. So it's, I'm, I'm going to fold my arms and wait for the end. No, it's about negotiating and thinking about these ideas as we go. But he talks about, he writes about rather a temporary, uh, temporary commitments to people. This idea that society, the more it speeds up, uh, the more kind of disposable uh people are in maybe in relation to one another that's a really interesting concept to consider because we're now in this age of social media now this book was written written like decades before the internet was commonplace um but this idea of but art but do we treat each other disposably online and uh you know and i think about all the people like on instagram or, or place like this where we're kind of like projecting certain ideas or maybe like building up personas quote unquote and and, and and what's the level of disposability there and and what does that what is that it's sort of we gave up maybe communal experience like the the neighborhood right the the, the courtyard and so on for a kind of digital environment um and so i don't know it's something to wrestle with and then the uh toffler uh, and others have called this the age of anxiety and stress. And so I think something that, that's highlighted in this feature is we're gonna see, we're gonna see characters grappling with, with concern about how the status quo is. The status quo meaning the way things are here and now. All right, and so film focus, let's break it down. Final points and we're, we're gonna get started. If you, uh, surely you've seen it by now, but if you haven't, I did, I intentionally held back on releasing our film of the week. I don't want people going too, too, too far on a deep dive before we got into this because it's, it's an interesting one. All right. So we're going to check out, this is our, this is our earliest feature and the way it's marked 
over subsequent weeks, we're really going to move forward in time. That's really exciting. We're going to be accelerating in our pace, just like Future Shock uh, 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 suggests we are as a society. So um, we're going to check out a film from 1973. So it's going to, in some ways, it's going to be dated. And, and let's just, like, we're going to embrace that and, and feel free to laugh at it. Um, 1973, Soylent Green, all right? This is based on a book, um, a, a novel, relative, relatively faithful uh, adaptation, but it t it's got its own liberties um, and, and, and an interesting kind of behind the scenes history. Um, but this, this is uh, what's important for us to recognize is cultural context, all right? So every week something that's important is recognizing what's the cultural context in which this film was, was produced and released. I, that always matters. And, and we don't have to know that to enjoy something, but to appreciate what it's doing, I think it, it matters. So early 1970s, um, the US uh, is, is kind of coming out of a decade of social unrest in, in the 60s, a lot of political upheaval, and, and this kind of the, the um, this phase of, of uh, disputes, right? And we've got not only social and cultural uh, tensions, um, but going into the 70s, we now have economic tensions. And there are also concerns about, um, uh, about the, the stagnation of American cities, right? And you're seeing, you're seeing certain manufacturing industries starting to dry up a little bit, hence that term, the Rust Belt, right? That, that region of the Midwest. That some some areas of manufacturing are kind of they it's 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 you know evolve or or die and and um, we also have we also have a global recession and we always feel the global recession typically at a at an immediate level and so all of these all of these kinds of things are happening in the seventies we're on the precipice of an energy crisis that energy crisis is what uh, for. For, for a large part, gave uh, President Carter such a bad rap and probably cost him a re-election was just his soft approach to, to trying to wrestle with and handle it. Meanwhile, you have movies like Death Wish and Dirty Harry coming up and being these huge hits. And why? Because there's this, there's this national anxiety about our, our large inner cities being just ransacked and full of crime and just kind of the low point of civilization all this kind of stuff like and so there so you've got people on street corners calling for it it's it's you know we're coming to an end and um and this this film is kind of wrapped up in that type of anxiety but let's be more specific it's central uh it's central issue and it's, and it's going to articulate this at the beginning we get a little like written prologue which is that's always a nice add-on uh, but it deals with like a future in which a, a, a future for this time. So it's coming out 73. This film takes place 2022. All right. So it's imagining where we're at now. That's part of the fun part of this subgenre is it's used, it's playing with reality and trying to bend and interpret it in, in a kind of near future circumstance. Overpopulation, huge problem, according to this movie. Um, diminishing resources as a result, huge problem, part of this movie. Uh, and potentially when you have overpopulation, when you have diminished resources as a result and eco disaster combining with that, arguably human overpopulation equals eco disaster, but other ramifications that maybe they're putting in different terms, you end up with dehumanizing effects, okay? And so this is a, this is a French term that's used in, in film conversations a lot, mise en scène. I think this is a great film where the, it's, it's not about, the main narrative is, is fun and fine, but it's the mise-en-scene, it's the setting, it's the way it's casting a vision. I wouldn't use the term world building, but it's more about the way it's, it's dropping us in. It's dropping us into this world, and we have to kind of figure out like, oh, this is how people act in this world, this is how they respond to things, Oh, this is how they trade value. And I think that's significant. It's pivotal to appreciating what's going on in, the, in the, this world. Soiling green, um, it, it is kind of, uh, it, it, I was excited to see it pop up in uh, the initial chapter of our science fiction book. So that, it's, doing, it's doing some good business already there. Um, 
it's when I, when I mentioned it's an adaptation of a novel, it was also kind of mishmashed with another screenplay idea. So on one hand, we do get a bit of a detective mystery out of this movie. So congratulations there. Uh, I think Keith M. Johnson of, of a Critical Introduction to Science Fiction Film articulates how science fiction often operates at its height when it's genre mixing. And so we're going to see some kind of that mixture there, um, future shock. And then, as I, as I say, eco disaster, but also um, a kind of detective uh, uh, movie, right? There's a let's let's also consider it in the context of the 1970s. It's a little bit of a political conspiracy movie in certain ways, and that was a that was a popular theme because let's remember this is around that period of when Watergate was really kind of in the public eye and, and becoming that kind of you know, there's a lot of kind of trust issues with government. And of course we've solved all that, right? It's completely over. We've solved it perfect government now, right? Nobody's concerned about that anymore. Yeah. Um, so that mise en scene is like the little details, the little things they use to kind of tell you about this world. And early on, I think there's just some juicy visual details. Um, but one of the through lines in the film is about food because it's about diminishing resources. And so anytime you have a resource scarcity, uh, certain things that we take for granted every day are going to become high in value. And so you're going to, um, it creates it, it, anxiety, tension, all these things we talked about. So food's going to have this kind of role that it's playing um, because it's, a, you know, it's a scare, it, it's undergoing scarcity in an overpopulated world. And um, in particular, I think there's a, there's a sort of dining scene. It's not in a restaurant, but there's a dining scene. It's about mid-film. It's, uh, it's, it's the high point in the film for me. I, I think it's, it's an incredible piece of uh, a, a acting on display and filmmaking there. I just think it really works. Um, it actually, it's, 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 it's a kind of the characters are buying in in that scene and and i think if, if you're able to to get on that page then the, the the movie's having its effect this feature people it's it because of by nature's 1970s it's a little bit campy all right uh i think i think the weakest aspect of the movie is its music there's just this weird folksy kind of opening music I, it doesn't fit the tone at all i don't get what's going on there it's 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 out of place but I think we get past that. But some of the other stuff, there's some of that, that acting borderlines on camp. Um, but it's not all the time and not, not overwhelming, just kind of like the Roger Moore 007 kind of way. Um, there, but this film stars an uh, old, old movie star, right? We don't know who this is anymore, but Charlton Heston, <laughs> who played uh, Moses in the Ten Commandments. Is Cecil B. DeMille. Uh, blockbuster there and also uh, what won Academy Award for Ben Hur right she did Ben Hur he was uh, uh, that was that was sort of like it, it had all the uh, Oscar records until Titanic right something like that and then they tied her and then maybe like Lord of the Rings the third one um, but but so uh, Charles Heston had this kind of golden age uh, persona and then we get to the 60s and 70s and he made a trilogy of like 100% pure future shock sci-fi dystopian movies. And this is the middle one, uh, I believe. Um, the first would be the original Planet of the Apes. So we all, it was borderline, it was borderline, we almost went there, but I'm pretty sure we're familiar with it enough and probably have seen the newer ones, so less impactful. This one I'm betting we haven't had that much exposure to, so that's exciting. And then the other being the Omega Man, which was already a remake of the, a film with the same title starring Vincent Price, The Omega Man, remade decades later, I Am Legend with Will Smith, right, was also on deck, just waited at least, uh, and, but it's been repeated so many times. And actually, all three of those adaptations of, this is a nice closure here, Mary Shelley's other sci-fi dystopic book that no one ever talks about anymore, right, The Last Man. So there you go, take that to the bank. All right, here we go, 1973, Charlton Heston, and uh, Edward G. Robinson, who's like a top two all-time gangster movie star, 
This is his final role. He's, he's kind of extremely old man, like little old man at this point, but he's, he gives a great performance. And uh, he was, I mean, he was close to the end when he made this. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that afterward. It's very poignant in a way. Um, and so I feel like he was, he was dying of cancer at the time. And I, I sense some of that performance comes through in the urgency of his character. And this was also his 101st feature film, Edward G. Robinson. Um, so these two, these are the two characters that, that share this, this dinner scene. That, that I, it's, a, it's a quiet scene. I just want to make sure we're, it's not some like bing, bang, boom, like the rock doesn't show up, like throwing tables and stuff. Like it's just conversation piece, but it's the way the scene plays. And then all the other stuff, the bangs and whistles, right, of a 70s flick. So uh, let's get lost in that. And then um, we'll just kind of tiny wrap up at the end. And um, we will, we'll be virtually uh, finished. All right.